Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here. Welcome to the China History Podcast. Appreciate you all tuning in. Today I wanted to zoom in on the birth of U.S.-China relations. Not official diplomatic relations, but the time when these two nations first got together and saw each other up close. Now this is going to be a long episode, about an hour. I didn't want to break this up into two parts, so without further ado, let's get down on it. In a nutshell, the American colonies declared their independence from Great Britain on July 4th, 1776. And seven years later, on September 3rd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed at Versailles that, among other things, ended the Revolutionary War. And with that, like with South Sudan in July 2011, there was a brand new country on the world map, the United States of America. And just like any country must do when they become independent... The U.S. had to go forth into the world and get the word out and introduce themselves. Now, over in the Forbidden City in Beijing, the Qing Dynasty Imperial Court had no clue what was going on. When those who assembled at Independence Hall on July 4th, 1776 were inking their names to the Declaration, it was right about the halfway point of the Qianlong era. The dynasty... And China was really peaking about now. This was Imperial China's last hurrah. From here on out, especially after the passing of Qianlong, it's going to be all downhill for the Qing Dynasty. Our former colonial masters, the British, had been trading with China for quite a long time. The Honorable East India Company was founded in the year 1600, and thanks to their efforts the finest in Chinese exports, made their way from the city of Guangzhou, called Canton back then, to the homes of all British subjects, including those residing in the American colonies. But because of the monopoly granted to the East India Company by Queen Elizabeth I, no direct foreign trade was permitted between the colonies and any foreign nation. If you lived in Baltimore or Richmond and wanted to sip tea or buy some blue and white porcelain ware, you had to get it from England. English merchants handled all the direct trade with China and the Far East. If you saw an object on someone's mantelpiece in Delaware and it said, Made in China, it got there via England. Not only America's founding fathers, but their fathers as well. We're all aware that there was this country called China, and it was far away, and it was exotic beyond description. They knew China produced the silks that were as popular throughout the empire as they had been back in Julius Caesar's time. The same with tea. All the tea they consumed, morning, day, and night, it all came from China. They knew that, but not much else. They loved these Chinese imports back in the American colonies no less than anyone else loved them. Tea, of course, had grabbed hold of everyone. It was just as popular then as it is today. And the other things, the porcelain items, the silk garments and accessories, many people were mesmerized with the beauty of these things. And if the items were within their means, they had to possess it. These Chinese imports were something that people of the American colonies might adorn themselves with only on special occasions, or they might display some object that came from China in their parlor or above their hearth that might give off a, a whiff of the exotic and remind them of that mysterious and faraway place of legends. Some of the colonists might have read the tales of Marco Polo or had read a little bit about China here and there, but for the most part during the colonial period in the U.S., China was a land that no one knew much about, but they knew it was there. The beauty of the objects they saw that had come from China intrigued Western people as much as they had intrigued the Sogdians back in the Han Dynasty. Not only these imported goods, but chinoiserie as well was very popular. Chinoiserie took Chinese motifs and blended them with Western shapes and designs to create kind of a new style. On first glance, it looked and appeared Chinese, but upon closer inspection, you would see some... Western element added that gave it away. In the West, 
If there was a year that marked the line of demarcation between China, the legendary place, and China, the actual place, that would have to be 1735. That was the year Description de la Chine was published in four volumes. The author was Jean-Baptiste Duald. This book, freely available on the Google, was translated into many languages, and we in our little China History Podcast community know it as Duald's General History of China. Up until this seminal work was released for general consumption, pretty much anyone who knew anything about China obtained their understanding from Rusticello's best-known work about Marco Polo's travels, or alleged travels if you subscribe to the venerable Francis Woods theory. Up to the time of the Founding Fathers, there was no definitive work that neatly, articulately, and with such depth and scholarship presented China and Chinese culture to the West. With this newly published work, it spawned a whole generation of China experts and scholars, both professional and amateur. Too old, who lived from 1674 to 1743, came out with this general history of China right in the middle of the Renaissance. Voltaire was 41 years old, and Montesquieu, 46. Isaac Newton had only been gone for eight years. So if you can picture the times and who was around back then, we can all agree this was a pretty good and opportune moment in history for something like this general history of China to be published. Now, at last, Western people could sort of put their nose up against the glass and peer inside and read about descriptions of all these amazing things that up to now had only been privy to the Jesuits and those who were their allies. Now, at last, in 1735, when George Washington was three years old and still had years to go before he cut down that cherry tree, Jean-Baptiste Duald gave the world his magnum opus. Matteo Ricci's History of the Christian Expedition, 1608 to 1610, shed some light on China, but only as it related to the Jesuit mission. In 1665, there was Jan Nehoef's accounts in Dutch that told of his China travels in the earliest years of the Qing dynasty. It was entitled, Collection of Voyages as the Embassy of the Dutch East Indies Company to the Great Tartarian Cham, the present Emperor of China. When Thomas Jefferson was living in France, 1784 to 1789, his closest friend and the man who followed him into the White House, James Madison, father of the Constitution, had written and told him he must buy Duald's book and bring it back to the States. Jefferson and Madison had both read it. Benjamin Franklin had read it. Duhald's book made the rounds. Many people had read it or knew someone that did. It was one of those books. It was Americans' first chance to scratch below the surface and see what China you know, was sort of all about. Duhald's book was also published in a premium version that was titled The General History of China, containing a geographical, historical, chronological, political, and physical description of the Empire of China, Chinese Tartary, Korea, and Tibet. The preface of the book declared, quote, As China is the most remarkable of all countries yet known, the English reader must be greatly pleased to find the exactest account of it that has ever yet appeared in our language. End quote. And the punchline to all this is that Duald, he never even went to China. But he did talk to 17 guys that did. All Jesuits, of course. They always had the inside track. And these 17 Jesuits, upon their return to the continent at the end of their service, regurgitated everything they knew from all their collective years in China and in dealing with the Chinese. Then, Duald took all this information, organized it and condensed it, and put it all in this book. In 1687, the works of Confucius had first appeared in Latin. In fact, in 1733, a friend of Benjamin Franklin acquired a set of the Wu Jing and Si Shu, the five classics and the four books that made up the core of classical Chinese philosophy. During the period of the American Enlightenment that lasted from eh, about the birth of Franklin in 1706 to the death of Jefferson in 1826, Confucius really got put on a pedestal. In the colonies and after independence, the great sage was already being viewed in a 
positive light and as this symbol of moral rectitude. Benjamin Franklin had published excerpts from Confucius in his Pennsylvania Gazette. Among his many accomplishments, Franklin is also called the first American Sinophile. Besides this, there were many scholarly discourses and essays about China floating around in a whole bunch of magazines and pamphlets of the day. Thomas Jefferson greatly admired Chinese culture and attempted to weave parts of it into the fabric of the culture of this new nation that he was one of the many co-founders of. In particular, there were architectural elements and in how he designed his gardens at Monticello. He loved to blend Chinese elements together with the Italian architecture that he so loved. Voltaire had written later, quote, The Chinese for 4,000 years, when we were unable even to read, knew everything essentially useful of which we boast at the present day, end quote. In the 1780s, several Americans with pretensions to literary fame wrote these travelogues of their days spent in the merchant trade in China. Mind you, China, for any foreigner prior to 1841, meant Canton. Guangzhou, ever since 1757, all trade had been restricted to that place only. That's how it stayed for 85 years until the Opium War sort of whacked the piñata and added a few more holes. This was the first time, mid-1700s, that China trade mania arrived in the West. American colonial merchant traders eyed that place and wished they could get a piece of that market. But as long as America remained a colony of Britain, forget it. All American ships had to stay out of China. The East India Company held the monopoly for all trade. But not anymore. Not after the Treaty of Paris. By September of 1783, China was fair game. Being a free and independent country now meant the United States didn't have to put up with the EIC's monopoly. Now, at last, they could freely and legally sail their ships from Boston or New York or from wherever and sail directly to China to become fresh meat for the hapo and the kohong in Canton. Now that the newly created United States of America was free to get around the EIC monopoly, it didn't mean adventurous traders could just get up and head to Guangzhou. Back in the 18th century, this was a very... Very expensive endeavor, massively expensive, and risky, too. Even in the late 18th century, sailing from one end of the earth to the other was always an iffy proposition. You had the cost of the vessel, the crew, the insurance, the provisions, and last but not least, all the cargo of the highest possible value that you could cram into every available square inch of space. That could be more than $200,000 worth of goods, maybe more depending on how many Spanish silver dollars were loaded on board. So you had to be a man of substantial means in order to finance an expedition like this. My fellow Americans who are familiar with their early history might have heard of a guy named Robert Morris. No relation to Governor Morris, though they were close friends. He was probably the richest guy in America when... Paul Revere made his midnight ride on April 18, 1775. Along with Hiram Solomon, Robert Morris was the main financier of George Washington's Revolutionary Army. He also goes down in history as the only guy who was a signatory to not only the Declaration, but the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution as well. He was also credited with being the first one to use the dollar sign that we are so familiar with. He made his fortune in the shipping business. Robert Morris was keen to explore these deals that would involve trade with China. Fate one day brought Mr. John Ledyard face to face with Robert Morris. Ledyard was a Connecticut Yankee who ended up in the employ of the British Navy. He was on board the HMS Resolution during the famous voyage of Captain James Cook. Ledyard was a, a tragic comic figure. He was the guy who first figured out, when he was briefly docked in Canton in the service of the British, that the Chinese went gaga for North American furs, especially sea otter pelts. They fetched a very substantial premium and apparently weren't so easy to find in China. Sea otter fur was the Chateau Ikem of animal pelts. It was the 
softest, most luxurious, and had the highest concentration of hairs per square inch, about a million. And even back then, a good sea otter pelt would fetch 120 bucks, and that was back in the 18th century. Ledyard later wrote, quote, The skins, which do not cost the purchaser sixpence sterling, sold in China for a hundred dollars, end quote. With this amazing knowledge, Ledyard made his way back to the U.S. in 1782 and started shopping for a backer to finance this idea he had. It would involve buying sea otter pelts in the U.S. Northwest and then sailing to China and selling them at a vast profit and then using the proceeds to load up the vessel with porcelain, lacquerware, tea, and anything else that could fetch top dollar in New York, Boston, or Philadelphia. The key point was that Ledyard knew firsthand what the demand was in China for these sea otter pelts. And in fact, all furs. In his search for a backer, he of course went to New York, but only met a lot of looky Louis. Nothing panned out. He was just another guy with a great idea, but no funding, and he just couldn't find a backer. In 1783, he ended up getting hooked up with Robert Morris in Philly, and the two of them decided to go into business together on this venture. The plan was to put together three vessels that would sail together around Cape Horn at the bottom of South America, and then one of the three would head straight to Canton, and the other two vessels would head north to the Pacific Northwest and load up with furs and then rendezvous with the third vessel in Canton. Well, all kinds of headaches, heartaches, and setbacks ensued in trying to pull this all together. As excited as Robert Morris was to dive into the China trade, he was up to his eyeballs trying to get the new nation's finances in order. Washington had made Robert Morris a superintendent of finance of the United States, so he was only watching this China venture with maybe half an eye. He was committed, though, and had written to one of America's other founding fathers, John Jay, quote, I am sending some ships to China to encourage others in the adventurous pursuits of commerce, end quote. Robert Morris was really thinking big, but in the end, all the investors could muster up was a single vessel, 100 feet long and 28 feet wide, 360 tons only. And the grandiose plans to go pick up all these furs fell through, and they ended up with a completely different kind of shipping manifest instead. Ledyard's dreams went up in smoke. The vessel was laden with $119,500 worth of lead, cordage, woolen cloth, wine, brandy, rum, beaver furs, and $20,000 in Spanish specie, the international coin of the realm at that time. In addition to this, they packed up 30 tons of ginseng from Pennsylvania and Virginia. This is a very interesting story how the ginseng business started, but... I'm wandering off on too many tangents already. And this vessel was called the Empress of China. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Captaining this vessel was John Green, 47 years old, 6 foot 4, 300 pounds. It was his job to get the Empress of China to the port of Wampoa in Canton and back safely to the U.S. East Coast. The supercargo was Samuel Shaw. The supercargo's job was to deal with the cargo, to ensure its safety and integrity, to sell it, and to use his wits to make all the purchases wherever they went. Although Shaw wouldn't mix with any Chinese government officials in Canton, he was nonetheless appointed as a kind of unofficial consul by the U.S. Congress. Before the Empress of China set sail, there appeared in the Salem Gazette in August of 1783 an article that announced, quote, We hear that a ship is fitting out in Boston for an intended voyage to China, that her cargo out in money and goods will amount to $150,000, and that she will sail the ensuing fall. Many eminent merchants in different parts of the continent are said to be interested in this first adventure from the new world to the old. We have, at an earlier period than the most sanguine Whig could have expected, or ever hoped, or than the most inveterate Tory feared, very pleasing prospects of a very extensive commerce with the most distant parts of the globe. End quote. 
On February 22nd, 1784, the Empress of China sailed down the East River, past the southern tip of Manhattan, and started heading in the direction of West Africa. The War of Independence had only ended six months before, and the last of British troops had only vacated just a few months prior. The Empress of China headed southeast, across the Atlantic, stopping first in Cape Verde before, heading towards the Cape of Good Hope. By July of 1784, they arrived at the Sunda Strait that separated Sumatra from Java. It was a textbook voyage, low on drama and high on monotony. Between the Sunda Strait and Canton was about as pirate-infested a body of water as one could find on the planet. But fortune smiled on America's first vessel to sail these seas. They ran into the French naval ship Triton, packing 64 guns. The well-armed Triton kindly escorted the Empress of China from Mu Bay that is today part of Ujung Kulan National Park on the westernmost tip of Java in Indonesia, all the way to Canton, arriving there in August 1784. That's where it all began, August 1784. That was the big bang moment when Zhongmei Guanxi, U.S.-China relations, began. 238 years ago from when I'm recording this. That's when the first Americans came face to face for the first time with the people of China. Many American privateers had come to Canton before this, but that was before the new nation was established. Now, for the first time, a vessel sailing under the stars and bars made its way up the Pearl River estuary. And when they started running the gauntlet of toll booths and officials with their hands out. They were given the once-over, and they were just passed off as just another group of grubby Englishmen. Samuel Shaw and John Green made it clear to the officials that they had come from this new country, the United States. And when America finally bellied up to the bar and the Empress of China lined itself up alongside the other trading vessels... Everyone couldn't have been more welcoming and cordial. However, despite keeping up appearances, these other traders all smelled potential trouble right away. The particular Kohong merchant who got assigned to their case either didn't get it right or didn't want to deal with the hassle, so when he handed in all the paperwork to the Hoppo in Canton, he just ticked the box that said the Empress of China was a British vessel. As far as he can tell, he didn't notice any difference. Now, that's going to cause some complications later. China's population back then, after all those fat years of prosperity during the Qing Dynasty, was about 300 million versus the United States, who had a population of about 2 million, or roughly one-half a percent of China's number. And we've narrowed the gap since then. Let me quote from Captain Green's log on Tuesday, August 24th, 1784. Quote, 4 p.m. Light winds from eastward. Came to anchor with our best bower anchor in Macau Road in five fathom. The town of Macau bearing west-northwest three miles. Saluted the town with seven guns, which was returned by the fort. Mr. S. Shaw, our supercargo, accompanied by Mr. Swift, purser, had the honor of hoisting the first continental flag ever seen or made use of in those seas. At five, a Chinese boat came on board, took down the ship's name, Master's name, quantity of men and guns on board, where from and of what nation, then left us. End quote. The Chinese officials didn't know what to make of them. These Americans, there was no record of who these people were or their country. The Chinese initially just called them new people or even flowery flag devils. And when it was learned that these new people showed up empty-handed, without any of the expected ritual gifts. They reprimanded these Americans and told them, don't come back next time empty-handed, that the only reason they were being let off the hook was because it was their first time there. On the American side, there was no knowledge of protocol or about how the game worked. They learned it all by the seat of their pants, where to go in Macau to get the customs permits, then how to deal with the permits required as you as you pass the bogue, and then exactly where to sail in Wampoa, where to line up, which merchant would handle their case. I mentioned in, in previous episodes that these 
Kohong merchants in order to obtain their positions. Had to pay a vast fortune to get this appointment. So during the limited period that they were part of the Kohong, they had to maximize the benefits. And now, here came Yankee Doodle Dandy. Fresh meat. This First time visit by an American vessel came a year after the failure of the McCartney mission to Beijing and during the final years of the Qianlong Emperor's overly long reign. The Empress of China, sailing the new American flag, lined up alongside the 21 British, 4 French, 4 Dutch, and 4 Danish vessels that were docked there. That was a great moment of symbolism. Here was a Vessel flying a new flag that waved proudly in the wind next to the flags from the other great and ancient nations. It was too early to tell, and who knew at such an early stage if this new country would ever amount to anything or offer up any significant competition in those waters. Well, they'll find out later on that not only did Americans sell to their own home market... They even busted in on the British markets and in the West Indies markets, challenging the British even on their home pitch. It didn't take long. Samuel Shaw left us with many interesting first-hand observations from his journal. As he slowly made his way to the port, he gave a nice description of the scene there. He wrote, quote, The surface of the river was thickly covered with vessels of different sizes, of Singular forms and rigging, many of which were painted with gay and fantastical colors. Here were boats and small craft in great variety, with numerous junks of from four to five hundred towns burthen, covered with painted figures and glaring hues of almost every device that ingenuity could invent, all containing men, women, and children in grotesque garments huddled together in great numbers and actively engaged in different employments, while the crash of gongs and the hum of business heard from every quarter presented a scene full of life and hilarity. End quote. On September 14, 1784, one of the key rituals in the whole trading theater occurred when the hapo came to perform the measurement of the Empress of China. This would determine the amount that would be extracted from them in taxes and fees. And this was known as Kumshaw and Measurement. Kumshaw, you've all heard of, I'm sure. That's a little like Bakshish in the Middle East. The name means gold sands. Chinsha, which in mispronounced Cantonese is called Gumsa, which morphed into Kumshaw, like gold dust. It was basically a bribe offered up in the form of a gift. The Hapo, he was the Qing Dynasty official in Canton given responsibility by the emperor for controlling shipping, collecting tariffs, and maintaining order among foreign traders who called on Canton. Shaw put it this way in his journal, quote, At 10 a.m. came on board the Grand Mandarin with his attendants and the principal merchants of Canton to measure the ship, saluted them with nine guns, the Grand Mandarin sent on board as a present to the ship, Two bowls, eight bags of flour, and seven jars of country wine. End quote. This is where the Americans blew it by not knowing how the system worked. If someone had gotten a hold of the rule book, they would have known they were supposed to show the hapa when he came on board all of the finest things they carried. And these would serve as gifts that they brought for this highest of Chinese officials responsible for foreign trade. They were supposed to lay everything out in a nice little display, and then the hoppo would eh, pick out the stuff he wanted for himself, and it would all be packed up and sent to his magnificent residence, and to keep up appearances, you know, to show this wasn't a bribe. The foreigner was obliged to charge the hoppo for all these things, but, you know, the invoice was always written at perhaps 5% of its real value. This is how it worked. And the whole art of under-invoicing to avoid tariffs? Eh, It's still alive and well today. The Americans conveniently had in their possession a map of the world. And they were able to show the Chinese authorities exactly where they had come from geographically. They had to assure them they were not British, not in the least, and that theirs was a new and independent country. So despite showing up empty-handed, without the requisite gifts, they were still allowed to stay there with all the other gathered traders and sell their cargo and buy Chinese goods between September and December, 1784. 
One of the crew of the Empress of China, writing to his father in a letter, wrote, quote, The Chinese had never heard of us, but we introduced ourselves as a new nation, gave them our history with a description of our country, the importance and necessity of trade here to the advantage of both, which they appear perfectly to understand and wish, end quote. Unbeknownst to the American supercargo Samuel Shaw, in between the time they had left New York City and the time they arrived at their space along the dock, the price of ginseng, the main commodity they were carrying, had tanked, and their 30 tons was now worth substantially less than what they had anticipated. The best and most prized ginseng came from China's northeast and in Korea. Because of the massive Chinese demand for the stuff, imported ginseng started making its way to China in the 1740s. Once word hit the street that the Chinese liked the stuff, the magical powers of capitalism did their thing, and in no time at all, everyone who could get into the ginseng business did. And the price for imported ginseng went from about $15 a pound in Canton to a buck fifty to two and a quarter a pound. The American product wasn't as prized as the ginseng you could get up in Liaoning, Jilin, or North Korea, but it was certainly strongly in demand and satisfied the market. Reminds me of the time in 2000 or 2001, the outfit I was with took a big position in the knockoff Razor scooter importing business about 15 minutes before the bottom fell out of the market. Despite the unforgiving hand of the market, Everything got sold. Then, as was also the supercargo's job, he made all the purchases as well. He dealt with the Kohong merchant the whole time, and one of the major purchases was, of course, 700 chests of Bohe tea. They also bought 100 chests of Heisen tea that was also known as Lucky Dragon. It was called Xi Chun Cha. It was a green tea from Anhui. In addition to a hefty amount of porcelain, they also bought a load of trousers made from a material that was called nankin. Nankin was just a 100% cotton fabric that, as the name suggests, originally came from a cotton plant from Nanjing. The color was sort of a yellow or buff, and that was its chief characteristic. Later, this fabric will be produced everywhere, and all they did was dye the fabric to that color to give it that nankin look. It was a Big China export. The Americans figured out they desperately needed something else besides ginseng to narrow the trade deficit with China. When Samuel Shaw spent his several months in Canton, he observed the whole opium trade close up. He saw what the demand was and the kinds of profits that could be had in trading in these chests of opium. So the Americans, being an enterprising lot got into the opium business some years later in 1804. Some serious trafficking started going on. Now, you're probably wondering, how did they get a hold of all that opium? Didn't that all come from India? Well, not exactly. The Americans found their own supply, and this was in Turkey. They picked it up in Izmir at $2.50 a pound, and it fetched $10 a pound in Canton. The Turkish opium... It was not as fine as the Indian stuff, but it certainly did the trick and got these Chinese smokers high. The Americans sort of dealt with the opium business in a similar fashion as the East India Company. The shipping companies, they didn't soil their hands or reputation by shipping this addictive narcotic drug themselves to the China buyers. The actual job of shipping it to China and selling it into the market was taken care of by third-party vessels. Some smugglers, probably. The history books referred to them as country ships. And let me just add, the Americans were small-time petty dealers in opium compared to the British. Now, you'd think with all the ginseng, furs, sandalwood, and opium being sold into China, that the Americans would have a nice, favorable balance of trade. Well, this didn't happen. That's how huge the demand was back in the States for Chinese products. If they sold $150,000 in goods to the Chinese and picked up $200,000 worth of stuff in Canton, that balance $50,000 had to be covered in silver. That is, Spanish dollars and pieces of eight, the global currency of its day. 65% to 75% of U.S. imports were paid for in silver. So this whole hot-button issue with a trade deficit with China actually goes back a couple centuries and didn't start with China's economic reforms of the 1980s. 
On May 11, 1785, the Empress of China arrived back where it had all started, sailing home up the East River. After all accounts were settled, Robert Morris and his fellow investors, despite the bottom falling out of the ginseng market, made a nice $30,727 profit on the venture, which was more than a 25% return on their initial investment. Not bad. Bernie Madoff only got his investors 12%. After he got back, the supercargo of the Empress of China, Samuel Shaw, duly wrote up all his notes and recollections and reported to John Jay as follows, quote, To every lover of this country, as well as those more immediately concerned in its commerce, it must be a pleasing reflection that a communication is thus happily opened between us and the eastern extremity of the globe, end quote. John Jay replied to Shaw that the U.S. Congress felt, quote, a particular satisfaction in the successful issue of the first effort of the citizens of America to establish direct trade with China, which does so much honor to its undertakers and conductors, end quote. Word traveled fast about the success of the Empress of China and the profits earned by its investors. There was also talk on the streets about how, with this achievement in China, it showed how their new nation was emerging onto the world scene. Although everything had been nice and friendly during this first American visit to China, the British traders at once began to circle the wagons, and from here on out, the relations between American and British traders were often anything but cordial. But of course, Winston Churchill in 1946, with his famous speech, will spotlight the special relationship, and, well, now we're family once again. After the success of the Empress of China, the rush was on. It was written, quote, Every little village on every little creek with a sloop that could hold five Yankees was now planning to embark upon the Far Eastern trade, end quote. During the three decades since the voyage of the Empress of China in the year 1814, around 300 American ships made 618 voyages to Guangzhou, and this didn't include the smuggling vessels. A whole new industry was suddenly born. People rushed in, and from this budding U.S.-China trade, pioneered by the success of the Empress of China, came America's first millionaires and multimillionaires. But once Americans came calling to China, they learned the same thing that everyone else knew. The Canton system stacked the deck totally against the foreign traders. But despite all the taxes, fees, bribes, and various other hidden costs, the China trade was still quite profitable. One man who took the lead in this emerging market was one John Jacob Astor, the first prince of China trade. He began his business in 1800 and built a fur trading empire, and most of his profits came from offloading these animal skins in China, where they fetch the highest prices. And he took a lot of these profits and plowed them into Manhattan real estate and other investments. We mostly remember this man's great-grandson, John Jacob Astor IV, who tragically but bravely died on the Titanic at the age of 47. The Astor name, of course, is a great and historic name in the annals of American history, and state of New York. Stephen Gerard was another one who did particularly well in the China trade. Both Astor and especially Gerard, as Robert Morris did during the Revolutionary War, almost single-handedly financed the American side of the War of 1812. These men who engaged in this trade were the first American tycoons. They did especially well during the Napoleonic Wars from 1792 to 1815 because, you know, being neutral in all, these American vessels were less apt to fall prey to French or British naval ships. Okay, one last commercial break, and we'll be right back. To suddenly have this vast market available couldn't have come at a better time for the United States. The ripple effect of this China trade that ran up and down the whole U.S. economy was felt everywhere. For example, the shipbuilding industry was massively affected. This, in turn, employed thousands upon thousands in the shipbuilding and shipping industry. In addition to this, there were all the suppliers to this industry, too. This is just one example. Wealth was created, and from this wealth, the American nation, at its earliest and most vulnerable time, was able to give its budding economy some well-needed traction. And from ginseng, furs, and silver, the Americans in the early 1790s, found a fourth thing that 
the Chinese market had quite the demand for, and this was sandalwood. It came from Hawaii, the Sandwich Islands. Later on, this resource was also discovered in Fiji. That's where American vessels packed with sea otter pelts sailing from West Coast ports would stop to stock up on provisions before making the final beeline to the South China Sea. Whatever empty cargo space remained, they'd top it off with sandalwood. You gotta believe, trying to satisfy Chinese demand for sea otter furs and any skins from fur seals and all the sandalwood, that had a devastating impact on the whole ecology of the region. Forests were cut down to the last tree. So many fur seals and otters had been trapped that they began to become scarce, and in this, of course, threw the whole ecosystem into disarray. Even today, our worldwide demand for seafood is depleting parts of the oceans. We're such a resourceful species, but eh, we require a lot of time to learn our lessons. It's interesting to note that the whole business of OEM manufacturing in China had also already begun. This is where a factory will manufacture something or other according to the design and specifications given to them by a customer. And this is more or less the business I engaged in for more than 35 years. Not content just to buy Chinese-designed porcelain, the enterprising American traders would bring their own designs to these Chinese merchants and ask them to make these porcelain dishes or this tea service or whatever using American motif designs that they brought with them. And then Chinese would take the order, manufacture it, and sell it to them. It was made in China porcelain with perhaps an image of George Washington or the American flag. Between 1784 and the Terra Nova incident of 1821, U.S.-China relations were played out on the docks of Wampoa in Guangzhou. The Americans were rather content to sit back and let Britain do all the dirty work of pushing China around and softening them up to get them to open up more ports. In these first decades, the whole matter of China's relationship with the U.S. was all measured through the prism of commerce. Now, I mentioned the Terra Nova incident. This was the first diplomatic incident that happened between the U.S. and China. Some poor guy named Francis Terra Nova was on board an American vessel in Canton and threw a jar or something overboard, and it hit a Chinese boatwoman who was unfortunately, right in harm's way. The thing hit her on the head and knocked her in the water, and she sadly drowned. As far as Chinese law went at that time during the Qing dynasty, there was no differentiation made between a death caused by accident and one caused by malicious intent, as far as Chinese law was concerned. Same thing. American law made the differentiation, so that was the rub back in 1821. And just like we're experiencing in our day, a good old-fashioned standoff ensued. But in the end, facing the prospect of not being allowed to trade with China, the American side had no choice but to hand Francis Terranova over to the Chinese authorities, and he was dealt a little Chinese justice. The U.S.-China relationship, however, survived the Terranova incident okay. The Americans already knew how this was all going to play out because the Empress of China just happened to be present in Canton between November 24th and December 6th, 1784, when the Lady Hughes affair went down. This was a British ship that got entangled in a similar predicament. One of their gunners, when firing a salute, as commanded, accidentally blew away two Chinese nationals who were unexpectedly passing through harm's way. The Chinese demanded the British offer this gunner up. There was the usual standoff and huffing and puffing and posturing. And then the Chinese official in charge slapped an embargo on all British ships. And finally, after realizing that the Chinese officials were holding all the aces, the Lady Hughes surrendered the guy who was shortly thereafter executed. But remember, the lazy Kohong merchant I mentioned earlier who registered the Empress of China with the Hapo as a British vessel? Well, the Empress of China ended up getting caught up in the embargo too, which was only meant to affect the British country ships from India. Samuel Shaw and another key player in this venture, who I haven't mentioned, Thomas Randall, appealed to the French consul to advocate on their behalf. They wrote, quote, Sir, the undersigned supercargoes for the American commerce in China 
beg leave to acquaint you that they have undoubted reason to believe that through the misrepresentation of our Kohong merchant were reported to the Hapo as being Englishmen, and the ship in which they arrived at this place as an English country ship, and consequently they should be considered subjects of Great Britain. To take off from this misrepresentation and to announce to the Chinese that we are the subjects of a free, independent, and sovereign power is the reason for our present application. And we request, in the name of the United States of America, the allies and good friends of His Most Christian Majesty, that you will cause to be made known to the Chinese that we are Americans, a free and independent and sovereign nation, not connected with Great Britain, nor owing allegiance to her or any other power on earth, but to the authority of the United States alone, and that we pray the Chinese to consider us in that view and grant us our passports accordingly. End quote. The United States continued to follow the policy of maintaining a steady course with China trade, allowing Britain to do all the heavy lifting and just following their lead. You know, of course, where this is all heading, the 1830s. The Opium War is going to break out in 1839. Then, when Britain and China ink that most famous or infamous of the unequal treaties, it's going to freak American traders out. They saw how Britain rammed this treaty down China's throat, and now they had five more ports to sail to, extraterritoriality and all the usual imperialist demands. The United States government perceived this as a threat that would put Britain in the position to have a leg up on all U.S.-China commerce. The traders saw nothing good in this for them, and they, being the most moneyed of the moneyed class, leaned hard on their congressmen and whoever else they had access to and said something had to be done about this. The American traders wanted the same exact benefits that Britain got. But in order to do that, they had to go to China and negotiate this. Now, up to this point, the United States, relatively speaking, even in 1840, you know, was still a new country. Although the economy was growing by leaps and bounds, the Americans still didn't have the ability to maintain overseas diplomatic posts or to project power in any way. There's no 750 foreign military bases spread across 80 nations yet. So this was a pretty big step to consider, going to China to sign a treaty. This is where Caleb Cushing enters our story. He was from Massachusetts, where most of the China traders were based. He was their guy. And if that wasn't enough, Cushing's father had moved out to the Pacific Northwest, to Oregon, and he was knee-deep in the China trade. And so, in the 1830s, Caleb Cushing, with his father's interests in mind and the interests of all these Massachusetts China traders he represented, became the first person in the U.S. government to advocate for the establishment of some kind of official relations with China. Up to now, going back to the Empress of China... There was still nothing. The two countries traded products, but no ambassadors had been exchanged and no treaties had been entered into. Caleb Cushing had two big friends in Washington. One was the 10th president of the United States, yes, His Excellency himself, John Tyler, and the other was the Secretary of State, Daniel Webster. Those two looked at Cushing as their China expert and Knowing how to talk the talk, he was very influential over them when it came to that whole subject of China trade. In addition to serving as a U.S. congressman during Tyler's administration, Caleb Cushing would later serve as attorney general under the 14th president, Franklin Pierce. Once the Treaty of Nanjing happened, Cushing really turned up the heat and said, the United States government had to do something or else it would adversely affect the interests of American trade in China. He vehemently argued, quote, If the United States did not act in the Far East, the British would seize Japan and Hawaii, giving them control of the Pacific to the immense future peril not only of our territory possessions, but all our vast commerce on the Pacific, end quote. But in 1843, with the terms of the Treaty of Nanjing reverberating around the corridors in Washington, Tyler nominated Cushing as commissioner and U.S. ambassador to China. In China, this was during the final years of the historically unlucky Daoguang Emperor. All the way up to 1857, the U.S. was represented in China by these commissioners like Cushing, rather than full-fledged ambassadors. There wasn't any system in place yet to handle this kind of formal diplomatic arrangement. 
so lacking credentials for now, Caleb Cushing was only an envoy rather than a full-fledged ambassador. So with Cushing's influence, John Tyler now announced that official U.S. policy from now on considered the Pacific Ocean and Hawaii to be within the sphere of U.S. influence. The feeling around Washington was that these actions would counter any kind of threat to the possible British monopolization of the China market. Tyler requested funding from Congress to pay for a full-time commissioner to reside in China to look after American interests there. Tyler received support even from one of his political enemies, the sixth president of the United States, John Quincy Adams. Adams had said that this proposed mission would, quote, provide the means of future intercourse between the United States government and the government of China, end quote. The issue was debated in Congress in February of 1843, and the House ended up passing the bill, voting 96 to 59 in support. Daniel Webster, who used his formidable influence to push this bill forward, after passing it, declared it would be, quote, the most important mission in history, end quote. And 129 years later, Nixon would call his visit to the Middle Kingdom, quote, the week that changed the world. You can always rely on us Americans to come up with these colorful superlatives. Well, the mission went ahead, and the upshot to all this is the Treaty of Wangxia. President Tyler's commissioner and envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary of the United States for China, Caleb Cushing, and his entourage sailed to Macau, and there he met with his counterpart, Qi Ying. Qi Ying of the Imperial House of Da Qing was also guardian of the heir apparent, governor general of the two Guangs, and superintendent general of the trade and foreign intercourse of the five ports. He was a Manchu from the royal family who goes down in history as the signer not only of the Treaty of Nanjing, but this one at Wangxia with the Americans, and the Treaty of Wampoa with the French, and the Treaty of Canton with Sweden and Norway. So he got the dubious distinction of being the signer of all four of the unequal treaties that followed the disastrous defeat in the Opium War. No need to get into what happened next. We all know from this point forward until liberation in 1949, China's going to suffer one humiliation and loss of face after another, not to mention a few rebellions, famines, and invasions. Wang Xia was located in Macau, in the northeast part. The actual treaty itself was signed at the Guanyin Temple, which previously was known as the Puji Chanyuan. It's still there today if you want to visit. And the treaty was inked on, quote, the 3rd of July in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1844, and the 24th year, 5th month, and 18th day of the reign of Daoguang, end quote. Article 1 went like this, quote, There shall be a perfect, permanent, and universal peace and a sincere and cordial amity, between the United States of America on the one part and the Da Qing Empire on the other part, and between their people, respectively, without exception, of persons or places. End quote. Well, that part was okay. Good way to start U.S. China official relations. But the other 33 clauses in the treaty pretty much echoed everything that was contained in the Treaty of Nanjing, plus a couple other conditions, such as allowing for. Protestant missionaries in China and their protection, and also from now on it was okay to hire tutors and learn the Chinese language, Mandarin, without the risk of getting executed. So with the Treaty of Wangxia, unequal as it was, America and China entered into their first official diplomatic exchange. To show their sincerity, the American side came out against the dealing of opium. Article 33 stated, Citizens of the United States who shall attempt to trade clandestinely with such of the ports of China as are not open to foreign commerce, or who shall trade in opium or any other contraband articles of merchandise, shall be subject to be dealt with by the Chinese government without being entitled to any countenance or protection from that of the United States. But Article 21 of the treaty sort of made a mockery of that when it stated, quote, Subjects of China who may be guilty of any criminal act towards citizens of the United States shall be arrested and punished by the Chinese authorities according to the laws of China, 
and citizens of the United States who may commit any crime in China shall be subject to be tried and punished only by the consul or other public functionary of the United States, thereto authorized according to the laws of the United States. And in order for the prevention of all controversy and disaffection, justice shall be equitable and impartially administered on both sides. End quote. Now some, including the American Dean of Chinese Studies, John King Fairbank himself, said this treaty didn't really constitute any kind of U.S.-China policy. Real U.S.-China relations didn't begin until later on in 1898 when William Woodville Rockhill proclaimed, quote, All nations, including the United States, could enjoy equal access to the China market, end quote. This essentially was his call for America's so-called open-door policy. And Rock Hill is considered the father of that policy. Two things led to this. First was Japan's defeat of China in the First Sino-Japanese War, and then America's acquisition of the Philippines following the Spanish-American War in 1898. The fear in the U.S. was that China was simply going to be partitioned by Japan, Britain, and others, and, well, this wasn't going to be good for U.S.-China trade. So this open-door policy was meant to protect American business interests there. And once we had our feet firmly planted in the Philippines, this gave us a nice, convenient base from which to have a much larger voice and presence in China. And it's at this point that John King Fairbank says U.S.-China policy really began. William Woodville Rockhill, by the way, aside from being a fluent Mandarin speaker, was also the first American to study and learn how to speak Tibetan. He was considered the father of Tibetan studies here in the U.S. He was also our guy in Beijing when it came time to negotiate the Boxer Protocol. He's a great late 19th century diplomat who had a big impact on our China policy and well, isn't terribly well known, which also makes him fodder as a future China History podcast episode. And so, my fine friends, that is the story about the earliest days when Zhong and Mei, China and the USA, first started mingling and getting to know one another in China. May I heartily recommend a few good texts for anyone wishing to learn more. First is Eric J. Dolan's When America First Met China. This book came out in 2012 and was published by Liverite Publishing. I also want to recommend The Empress of China by Philip Chadwick Foster Smith. These two volumes combined will offer you, I think, every possible conceivable nugget and crumb of information that you could ever hope to know about the voyage, trials, and tribulations of the Empress of China and everyone who was associated with this venture. There were rogues galore. I only scratched the top of the surface. And even though the venerable John Pomfret's book, The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, it wasn't published at the time when I first released this episode back in November 2013, but by all means, if you're interested in the history of U.S.-China relations, that's one of the best books on the subject. Links to everything, of course, at the show notes at the teacup.media website. Wow. This is one heck of a whopper of an episode, just over an hour, with not one, but two commercial breaks. Sorry about that. Hey, you know, you could enjoy beautiful and pleasurable ad-free listening by supporting me on Patreon or CHP Premium. Ad-free listening, bonus episodes, and more. Info, of course, at the show notes. Okay, thanks one and all, if you made it this far. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from somewhere in Los Angeles, do take care, everyone, and I hope I'll see y'all next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. <laughs>